أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين كفروا وصدوا عن سبيل الله أضل أعمالهم والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وآمنوا بما نزل على محمد وهو الحق من ربهم كفر عنهم سيئاتهم وأصلح بالهم ذلك بأن الذين كفروا اتبعوا الباطل وأن الذين آمنوا اتبعوا الحق من ربهم كذلك يضرب الله للناس أمثالهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته By the blessing of Allah we're starting Surah Muhammad and I pray that Allah gives me the ability to make the lessons of this surah clear and easy to understand and inshallah ta'ala easy to remember because it is one of the difficult surahs in the Quran Surah Muhammad was revealed uh, a short time before the battle of Badr began and there are two surahs like that that deal with the subject matter of the battle of Badr and were revealed some time before. One of them is Surah Al-Baqarah. Baqarah talks about the opening of the Battle of Badr. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ The sanction to fight in the path of Allah was given in Surah Al-Baqarah. And this surah also. So it seems like it's a continuation of that subject matter that was discussed in the second half of Surah Al-Baqarah. However, it was made a separate surah by itself. And its name is also very unique, Surah Muhammad. And there's a lot of depth and there's a lot of wisdom in naming it in this way. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll see that when the ayah comes. This surah is also unique in that it has a style that no other surah in the Qur'an has. It begins abruptly, it begins with an ism mawsul. And ism mawsul is usually the continuation of a subject. It's not usually the beginning of a sentence. You don't really begin with alladhina normally. Unless you're talking as though you are, you are talking to people, first of all, who already know what you're talking about. And you don't want to spend any time in formalities. You see Allah Azza wa usually describes His praise. He usually describes the greatness of the book. He takes an oath. He gets the attention of the audience. And then He gets into the surah. But in this surah, it's as though it's, it's got a military nature to it. Because the general, he doesn't necessarily give an opening speech, get the attention of the soldier's audience, and then finally give them instructions. General walks in, gives the instructions. This is also why it's called Surah Al-Qital, the surah of fighting. So the military nature of the surah is even evident from the way it's structured, from the way its language is. And then, uh, just, just some more about the historical backdrop. One of the big differences between Muslims in Medina and Muslims from Mecca is that Muslims from Mecca have paid the price for being Muslim in this life. They've sacrificed, they've been insulted, they've been, they've been kicked out of their own families and their homes, they've been tortured and beaten, they've, some of them have even been killed. So they know what it means to be a Muslim and what price you have to pay to be a Muslim. Even though the Muslims of Medina overwhelmingly are sincere, they haven't yet made any sacrifices for Islam. And even their perception of Islam, because they're not coming from that background, their perception of Islam thus far is something beautiful, something that makes life soft, something that, you know, it's, you know, the, the salawat are there, the masjid is there. There's, it's a good vibe, it's community building. And all of a sudden, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from revelation, this is not something that was revealed in the Qur'an, but another form of revelation, wahi, that was given to the Prophet The Prophet said, we should go after, you know how he started sending those battalions? And I didn't give you the count. There were eight small military campaigns before Badr. Four of them involving the Prophet and four of them not involving the Prophet. Four Ghazu and four Siraya. And when he was involved, and even the ones he was involved in, if there were other tribes that came in the way, he started making peace treaties with them already. So the peace treaty thing was like, it, it was catalyzed after Hudaybiyah, but it was already starting even before the battle of Badr was happening. And then the, the tipping point was one of those small campaigns, as I told you, they got caught and a fight broke out. And the other one, Abu Sufyan sending the SOS. That's what led the, Muslim, the, the, the Quraysh to send out their army of a thousand. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he's given clear choice, he says we should go to war. We should go after the people of Quraysh, the army that's coming to meet us. We should head to the battle of Badr. So there were people that had a real problem with that. 
they understood that the, the Muslims, you know, they've been tortured and beaten, the, the Muhajirun have been tortured and beaten. But the Nasara, you know, we understand that you were offended and therefore you should try to get some of your assets back by robbing or raiding the caravans that are passing through because you have a right to do that. But all out war, is that really necessary? We can just negotiate with the Quraysh. And after all, it's been six months and they haven't done anything. And the only reason they're coming out is because it seems like we're the ones that are on the offensive now. Right? So there was a sentiment among some Muslims that, you know, I don't know if this is all that necessary. Maybe there's another way. Maybe there's a peaceful way out of this. This wasn't necessarily only the sentiment of, you know, hypocrites. But there were um, some who were just new to Islam and saying, why are we even going into war? What's the, what's the necessity of it? Now the people from Mecca knew the necessity of it. They've, they know what, is, what Islam has taken. And, and then the idea of this, Islam is supposed to be peace. It's supposed to be, you know, and to addul amanat ila ahliha. It's supposed to be give the amanat to everybody else, take care of your neighbor, do ihsan. So why, why this, this war? But we have to understand, at this point, the Prophet ﷺ is has developed, has cultivated a nation, not a group. In a group, there are negotiations. There are, you know, and there's, there's slow development. With a nation, there's constitution, there's law. And now the messenger's instruction is, let's go. Now the first thing that the Muslims are told, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Those who have disbelieved and stopped themselves and others from the path of Allah, أَضَلَّ أَعْمَالَهُمْ All of their deeds have been put to waste. In other words, whatever advances they're making towards you, the Quraysh, it's already been put to waste. Battle hasn't even happened yet. But all of their a'mal, even in the akhirah, but even in dunya, no big deal, it's done with. Of course, when you read kafaru, Disbelievers, you're thinking of Makkah, you're thinking of Saddu An Sabilillah, those who stop themselves and others from Allah's path, you're thinking of Makkah. But as we run into the surah further, we'll find out that Allah meant something more. That Allah was saying something more. And we'll see that as the surah progresses. Those who and on the other hand, those who believed and have done the, the righteous deeds. وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِّلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ And this is already understood in Walladina Amanu. When you say, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It means they believe in everything. Allah, the angels, the revelation, the prophets. But Allah adds those who believed and did righteous deeds. And they believed in what was revealed upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِّلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ What was revealed upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The Qur'an. But actually here he did not say, بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ He said, بِمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ Whatever was revealed onto Muhammad, whatever was sent down to him, whether it was Quran or it was Sunnah, whether it was a hadith, whether it was an, a, a feeling put in his heart, all of it is included now, not just the Quran. Now, these, there was a, a worse group within the hypocrites, or within the weaker Muslim ranks, the hypocrites, who developed this idea that we should take the Quran seriously. Because the Quran, after all, is the word of Allah, and the means by which it is delivered is this Prophet. But the Prophet himself, he's just a person. So if he has an opinion about something, that's his personal initiative. We shouldn't have to follow him in what he wants to do. We should only have to follow Allah. We should only have to follow Allah. We don't have to follow the Prophet necessarily. He's just a delivery mechanism. Okay. In the Quran, Allah usually, the four times that Muhammad is mentioned in the Quran, out of those three times, Allah usually mentions Rasul. Muhammadun Rasulullah walladhina ma'ahu. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum walakin Rasulullah wa khatam al Okay? Then in Surah uh, um, Al Imran, you know, what's the ayah? Wa ma Muhammadun illa Rasul. Muhammad comes, Rasul comes. Even when Ahmad comes, wa mubashiran bi Rasulin yati min ba'd ismuhu Ahmad. So Rasul is mentioned, Ahmad is mentioned. This is one of the honors of the Prophet Wasallam uh, that when his name is mentioned, Allah mentions his title with it. He mentions his title with it. And speaking of which, when Allah addresses his Prophet wasallam, He addresses him differently than any other Prophet was addressed. When Allah talked to Adam wasallam, He said, Ya Adam, uskun anta wa zawjukal jannah. When he saw, talked to Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim. When he talked to Musa wasallam, Ya Musa, innani an Allah. Ya Isa, inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. Ya Zakariya, you know, inna nubashiruka bi ghulam in ismuhu Yahya. Ya Yahya, khudil kitaba bi quwa. Every prophet is addressed by their name. Allah never says Ya Muhammad in the Quran. He says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, 
يا أيها الرسول يا أيها المدثر يا أيها المزمل Allah calls him by his title this is one of the honors of the Prophet ﷺ in the Quran you ever seen those big giant posters that say Ya Muhammad okay Ya Muhammad that's not in the Quran anywhere and actually there, it is found in the hadith it is found in the hadith and you know in that hadith what happens people came out to the Prophet ﷺ and said Ya Muhammad ukhruj alayna Muhammad come out we want to talk to you Right? And the ayah came down, don't you call him like that, because all your deeds will be taken away. <laughs> and now we make posters that say, Ya Muhammad. It's kind of ironic. Allah didn't even say that. Allah said, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, Ya Ayyuhan Rasul. You know? So, yeah, in your deeds, yes, we'll talk about that, inshallah. Okay, so, the, the, the use of the word Muhammad here, without Rasul. Why? What are some benefits of that? Because this is the only time. Every other time, Muhammad or Ahmad is mentioned, what comes with it? Rasul. Every time. Except this one place. What does Rasul mean? Messenger. Someone who has a message to deliver. And what's the fundamental message of the Prophet ﷺ? The Qur'an. The Qur'an is the message. So the hypocrite says, yes, he's Rasul. He's Rasul. I mean, he, we, we like him because he delivered the message. But him by himself, if he's not Rasul, him for his own sake, is not worth much. Allah Azza wa Jal says, yes, He is. Even when I don't mention that He's Rasul. وَآمَنُوا بِمَا نُزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ That man, without his title, him for himself, whatever was sent to him, whatever he speaks, whatever instructions he give, gives. And what instructions specifically? Let's go meet them in battle. That's what's being talked about here. وَهُوَ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ And that is the truth. And He is the truth. And whatever is revealed to Him is the truth from their Master. كَفَّرَ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَأَصْلَحَ بَالَهُمْ He buried away from them their sins. And He corrected their situation. بَال يعني شَأْن حَال Situation. بَال also means your development. Meaning He molded them through trial. He fixed their situation means He molded them over time. They've continued to show that, that loyalty to Muhammad wasallam, And as a result, over time, they've become stronger and stronger people. Allah has fixed their situation. أَصْلَحَ بَالَهُمْ He's molded their character. Now, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا اتَّبَعُوا الْبَاطِلِ this battle will take place and Allah will cancel out their deeds because those who have disbelieved have proven that they, have, they followed falsehood. Ittaba'ul batil is in the past tense, right? As opposed to Allah saying, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَتَّبِعُونَ الْبَاطِلِ they, That they follow falsehood or they will follow falsehood. No, no, no. They've shown that they've followed falsehood. That's the final verdict on them. They're a lost cause now, these Makkans. Now the, there's no more time for talk with them. Now it's time for war with them. وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّبَعُوا الْحَقَّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ And those who believed have proven themselves by following the truth from their master. كَذَلِكَ يَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ أَمْثَالَهُمْ And that is how Allah strikes examples for the benefit of people of their likes. Their likes meaning there are other samples. There are other peoples that have been mentioned in previous, previous nations that were like the believers. And there are previous peoples mentioned that are like the disbelievers. And plenty of samples have been shown already. And so those samples mean that finally Allah's wrath comes on disbelievers. In all of those historical samples Allah keeps citing, well that's going to happen to these people. You, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, you people are going to be Allah's punishment on them. You're going to be the divine retribution against them. فَإِذَا لَقِيتُمُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Then when you meet those who've disbelieved in battle, لَقِيَا to meet, but in Arabic also, لَقِيَا فلان also means meet, meeting them in battle. When you come into contact with them, when you hit them, when you, when you come at them face to face, فَضَرْبَ الرِّقَابِ Then the only thing to do is to strike the backs of the neck. فَضَرْبَ الرِّقَابِ يعني فَضْرِبُوا ضَرْبَ الرِّقَابِ There's a fi'il, there's a verb implied behind it. And it, it actually, يَدُلُّ عَلَى السُرْعَى حَذْفُ الْفِعِلْ هُنَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى السُرْعَةِ Quickly just do away with them, not annihilate them, strike the necks. حَتَّى إِذَا أَثْخَنْتُمُوهُمْ Until you have thoroughly shed blood and the warmth of blood is spilled everywhere. إِثْخَان in Arabic is to, uh, blood to be warm. And literally you've annihilated the enemy and there's just blood everywhere. You've dis destroyed them in the battlefield. فَشُدُّ الْوَثَاقِ Then tighten up. Tighten up the ropes, wathaq. Meaning when you take the captives, then don't just take the captives nicely, 
tighten their ropes and squeeze them so they're, they're in pain as they're walking. This is the, like take a tough stance even against the, the enemies that you take on hold. Ahkimu qayd al asara minhum yani. Tighten up the, the, the ropes and the chains and the cuffs on the prisoners. Now, فَإِمَّا مَنَّمْ بَعْدُ وَإِمَّا فِدَاءً This is one of the hard ayat in the Qur'an, in interpretation. Then you have the option, after that, that you might be able to do them the favor of letting them go. يعني بإطلاق الأسارة مَنَّمْ بإطلاق الأسارة The favor of letting them go, freeing them. وَإِمَّا فِدَاءً Or you can demand a ransom. So Allah says, number one, when you meet them, destroy them. Two, when they're completely annihilated, if there's anybody left, take them prisoner. And once you take them prisoner, you have two options. Either you can take, you can let them go as a favor, as a gesture of goodwill, or you can take ransoms from them. Who are these people? These are the uncles, cousins, fathers, brothers of the Muhajirun. There's, this is a family reunion. Six months we haven't seen you and now we see you on the battlefield. You know, when, when Abdul Rahman tells Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, you were, you were in my target. You were in my crosshairs. I had pulled the arrow and you were the target. But I said, it's my dad. I pulled back. And Abu Bakr said, good. Because if you came in my view, I would have shot you. I would have taken you out. Allah is saying to the Muslims, now you don't think of them as your family anymore. You know how Nuh alayhi was told about his son, innahu laysa min ahlik? He's not your family anymore. These people used to, they had, they had all the opportunity. Now your family is the family of faith. Family who's with the Prophet. All those other ties are, are shed. And the most important ties are ties of blood. And the ayah says, shed all their blood. <laughs> Until the war drops down its arms. Now this is ex extremely important. There's battle and there's war. There's battle and there's war. Battle is one fight. The war is the continuous fight until it's all over. Now, this hatta tada al harbu awzaraha makes this ayah possible to interpret in two ways. This is, is there's two possible interpretations. One interpretation is that you shouldn't take prisoners; you should just annihilate them until the war itself is over. So, until the entire conflict between Mecca and Medina is over. The Meccans have been defeated, it's all over, until then don't take prisoners, just kill them. The other interpretation is no, you have the option to take prisoners, and you have to engage in war, but this war situation and your tough stance against the Meccans will last until the final war, until war drops its arms, until the war itself is finished. So one, op one interpretation suggests that you should never take prisoners. The other interpretation suggests, you can take prisoners, and if you take prisoners, what can you do with them? You can either let them go, or you can take a ransom for them. The other says, prisoner or not, kill everybody. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ, the war starts, the Prophet ﷺ takes prisoners. So his interpretation is that of taking the prisoners, which is perfectly understandable in the ayah. And this can also be understood as the Prophet assumed, ﷺ, that the war is over. We've won the war. And so we can take the prisoners. That's what the ayah suggests. Again, keeping in mind, this ayah came before the battle. So he implemented the ayah as best he understood it. When he took the prisoners, he took suggestion from the companions, what should we do with these guys? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu gave the suggestion that we should free them. We should get them to teach us how to read and write, those of them who know. And, or take ransom, or do it as a favor, gesture of goodwill. This will further demoralize them. What kind of army is this? They have such high moral character that they let us go. Or, Umar gave, gave a suggestion. Umar said, we should kill them all. Because they go back, they'll just be further reinforcement for next time's army. And plus, just to make sure our people are loyal, we should get their own family members that are Muslim to kill them. Umar's suggestion. Just to see if we're loyal. It's a true test of loyalty. Okay. The Prophet hears both options. And of course, because he is loving mercy to all mankind, which option does he take? Abu Bakr's option. Let's take that option. Then came the ayah from Surah Al-Anfal. There are two ayat that are very similar. They, they have similar language. This is one of them. This is before. And then came the ayah after. 
What's the ayah after? Ma kana li nabiyyin an yakuna lahu asra. Ayah number 66, Suratul Anfal. It is not becoming of a prophet to take prisoners of war. Hatta yuthkhina fil ard until he's completely shed blood and killed everybody in the land, meaning those who engaged in battle with him. Turiduna arada dunya. Are you looking for motives that will further worldly life? All of you? Wallahu yuridul akhira. And Allah, in fact, He wants the afterlife. Wallahu azizun hakim. And Allah is the ultimate authority. And Allah is all wise. Who did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala side with? Which, whose opinion? Um, Umar's opinion. But then the, and then the Prophet is deeply worried that he's made a mistake. But you see, as I mentioned to you before we got into this subject, is there a way to interpret this ayah that says you can take the prisoners? The room is there. The the imma man nambadu imma fida, and it's already mentioned. This ayah already came. So then Allah says, "Laula kitabum min Allahi sabaka." Again, Suratul Anfal. Had it not been a verdict, a law of Allah that has already come to pass, "Lamasakum fi ma afatum adabun azim." Then whatever you have done and you've, you've committed at this point, it, it would have caused you great punishment. It would have brought great punishment into contact with you. You would have been in big trouble had you let those prisoners go without this ayah having come already. This one that we're reading. So Allah made reference to the ayah in Surah Muhammad. And then since the Prophet is still worried, you would have been in big trouble. But that just means... I still didn't do the best thing. So Allah says, don't worry. So to Al-An'am, kulu mimma ghanimtu. No, no, you can eat whatever you've acquired. Halal and tayyib, and it's halal and good and pure for you. So now, this, this decision that the Prophet made, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is not a sin. It's a strategic decision. And it was well within the bounds of revelation. He didn't violate any revelation when he made this decision. But... As I mentioned to you before, the Prophet ﷺ has very high standards. So to him, this is like a sin. To us, it can't possibly be. But to him, it is. And when he thinks he's made a sin, made a mistake, then what does he do? A lot of istighfar. Keep that in mind as we continue. ذَلِكَ وَلَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ لَن تَصَرَ مِنْهُمْ All of that is going to be the case. You will engage in war. And had Allah wanted, He would have taken vengeance from them Himself. He could have annihilated the entire army. But He wanted some of you to be tested with others. He wanted to test some of you with others. He wanted to see who stands where. And those who were killed in Allah's path, then He won't be putting their deeds to waste. Their actions will not go unrewarded. Soon he will guide them. Soon he will guide them means even before Akhirah comes, he will guide them to Jannah. These are shuhada, they're going to be taken early. And he will fix all of their affairs. They're not going to be raised injured and battered and bleeding. And like you know, like Musab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. He's going to fix him up. He doesn't even have enough to cover his feet. When you take the, the, the garment, you cover his face, his feet show when he's buried. And when you cover his feet, his face shows. And he was, he was the GQ magazine cover in Medina, and back in the day, in Mecca. He was a good-looking man, always dressed imported clothing, imported colognes. Left everything for Islam. And the way even he died, subhanAllah. Radiallahu anhu, Allah says, Sayahdihim wa yuslihu balahum. And then, وَيُدْخِلُهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ And he's entering them into Jannah. عَرَّفَهَا لَهُمْ That he thoroughly introduced them to already. So as they walk into Jannah, they look at this tree and they say, Oh, wow. ذَوَاتَ afnan. That's what it was talking about. Then they look at the mansion and they say, Oh, غُرَفًا Then they look at the rivers and say, Oh, that's what Allah was saying. تَجْدِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Oh, that's what Allah was saying. وَفَاكِهَةٍ كَثِيرًا he already described it to me and then he gets to see it and he matches what he'd been hearing with what he sees. The Sahaba that go into Jannah early, Allah describes how they're going in, what they're seeing. Those of you who claim to believe, in Allah yansurkum. If you aid Allah, Allah will aid you. Now this is already, this is this is coming again before the battle. So we don't even know who's going to be killed. But those who are going to be killed are already looking forward to being introduced to their Jannah. They're, be, they're already being given that. 
Those of you who have Iman, if you aid Allah, Allah will aid you. And He will plant your feet. He will make you firm. You will not run from the battle. You see, before battle, we were given the dua of Dawood and his followers, Talut and his followers. وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Surah Al-Baqarah When they met the armies of Jalut, they said, Plant our feet firm. أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Pour, you know, pour patience onto us. It's like patience is this container, just empty it out on top of us. You ever seen that Gatorade thing that spilled over the championship winner? They just kind of douse him with, you know, the thing. The imagery is that of a large container with a fluid and it's being poured, emptied out on, on someone. Afriq alayna sabran. Pour patience onto us. Pour commitment onto us. Wathabit taqdamana and make our feet firm. Because when we see those gigantic armies coming, we might run. We might not even be able to help ourselves and run. You Allah, you make our feet firm. Allah says, you help Allah, Allah will help you. In tansurullah yansur. What does it mean to help Allah? What does it mean to help Allah? Isa alayhi salam is going to say a few surahs later in surah al-saf, man ansari ilallah. Who's going to aid me? Who's going to aid me against Allah? And, uh, and as a matter of fact, we've already learned that Allah is telling us that He wants our help. But the fact of the matter is, Allah is the one that helped us. وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّهُ Allah is the one who helped you at the occasion of Badr when you were weak. So what does Allah mean help? Help His Messenger. You know the dua makes us understand this. اللَّهُ مَنْصُرْ مَنْ نَصَرَ دِينَ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَجْعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ Ya Allah, help the one who helps the deen of Muhammad وسلم, and make us of them. You help this messenger in his mission, Allah will help you. Now, we ask Allah for things. We ask Allah for success. We ask Allah for protection. We ask Allah for the better of the Muslim ummah. But when our transactions are, and our businesses are riddled with riba, they're contaminated with riba, when we're consuming haram as a people, when there's lying and backbiting and abuse in the families, Everything this deen stood for is being violated. What good is that dua? What's that dua? How are you asking Allah's help? Allah is telling us, how do, you, how do you get Allah's help? You first have to help this deen. You have to help it become a reality for people to see. Then the aid will come. And then He'll plant your feet firm. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَتَعْسَ لَهُمْ تَعْسَ يَعْنِي هَلَاك وَعَثَار Destruction, annihilation. Also when somebody keeps on stumbling and they have nowhere to go, destitute. Destitution is for them. Those who disbelieve, destitution is for them. It's as though Allah is saying, they made you destitute. They put you out of your homes. But they deserve that. And he wasted away their deeds. This wasting away of deeds is mentioned over and over and over and over again. Why? Because the Quraysh thought they were so righteous. They thought they're taking care of Allah's house. أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَشِّدِ الْحَرَامِ Did you just think that giving drink to the people that make hajj and building al-Masjid al-Haram and taking care of it, being custodians of it, justifies everything that you do. Allah is crushing the mentality that just because you do some good deeds, gets, allows you to violate Allah's revelation and deny His Messenger and undermine His teachings. No, your deeds will be put to waste. And right up until now, still it seems like Allah is talking to disbelievers. As we'll see soon, that this whole conversation, had it was a double-edged sword. It was talking to the hypocrites also. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ That is because those are the people. They in fact, were, they detested what Allah sent down. فَأَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Then he seized and multiplied their deeds by zero. إِحْبَاط To cancel away something. To be done with something. And then, this idea, they didn't like what Allah sent down, but Allah took their deeds. By the way, أَعْمَال in Arabic generally is good deeds. أَعْمَال Unless you qualify it with سَيِّئَةً or asayyat, generally it means good deeds. So Allah is acknowledging that the Meccans have done some good deeds. They did take care of some poor people. They did provide courtesy to those who were coming to the Hajj. They did you know, do a good job in, in, in taking care of their tribes, people, etc., etc. They had some good qualities, sure. But none of that will count if you hate revelation. This answers a very big philosophical question for, for Muslim youth. Muslim youth say, you know, there are other people in my college. I have friends that are Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, atheists. They are good people. They're, I mean, they're not bad people. They're charitable. They, you know, they, they, they do good things. They're nice. I don't know what's, what's so bad about them. Allah says there's one problem. 
And it's not that they don't believe, but if they hate revelation, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَرِهُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ If you find those good people hating revelation, then none of that good counts. You don't get to decide what good is. You have some idea, Allah pre-programmed some definition of good and bad inside of us. We know what good and bad is to some extent. But the final verdict, the mature understanding of what good and bad is comes from Allah in revelation. You know, a child thinks it knows what's good and bad. But the parent says to the child, take the medicine. And the child says, no, it's bad. And the parent says, no, it's good. I'm telling you to take it. It's good for you. Now, this idea of the child being absolutely convinced it knows what, what's good for it. The child is absolutely convinced. There's no doubt in the child's mind. But the parent knows better. And what the parent is giving the child is not an act of hate. Even though the child thinks it is. Why do you hate me so much? Why do you want me to drink that icky stuff? You know? And the parent says, look, I know it's painful, but it's better for you. And I hate seeing you in pain, but the pain of not giving you this is far worse. You know? I mean, you can only imagine the pain of parents that put their children through chemotherapy, for example. You can only imagine how painful it must be. But the pain of knowing what's going to happen to the child if we don't do this? Allah asks us to do difficult things, painful things, sure. And if you think you feel the difficulty of it, Allah feels a lot more of it for you. Allah loves you way more than you can ever love yourself. Way more. But He asks you to do things because they're better for you. Whether you understand them or not. But people who refuse and they hate, they deny the love relationship that they should have with Allah, they hate whatever Allah sent down, then fine. Then the relationship is cut. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Didn't they go around in the land? فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Didn't they take a look at the outcome of those who came way before them? دَمَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ Allah crushed them. He caused a crushing on them. Meaning Allah threw things on them that crushed them. وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ أَمْثَالُهَا And for disbelievers, there are many samples of these kinds of people. It's not just those nations that you pass by, there are way nations all over the planet that Allah annihilated. They're just like these people. That is because Allah is the protecting friend of those who've believed. In divine speech, I talk about the difference between wali and mawla. I'll reiterate that for you here. Wali is someone who, prote who wants to protect you. Wali is someone looking out for you. Someone who takes responsibility for you. Someone who feels for you. Someone in charge of you even. Mawla is someone who actively aids you, protects you, who's protecting you. So, my brother is protective and my brother is protecting. My brother is protective of me, my brother is protecting me. When my brother is protective of me, he could live in a different country, but he's just protective of me. It's a feeling, it's a sentiment he has. But he, if he's living in another country, my brother cannot be protecting me. Mawla is someone actively protecting. That's why one of the meanings of Mawla in tafsir literature, you find Mawla a Nasir. Aid, helper, one immediately helping right now. In Surah Al-Baqarah, again another parallel, because the one we already saw a parallel between this and Surah Al-Baqarah, it is in Surah Al-Baqarah we read, Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu. Allah is the wali of those who believe. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاءُهُمْ الطاغوت. Those who disbelieve, their awliya are tahut. So we have a wali, our wali is Allah. Our protective friend is Allah. And the protective friends of disbelievers are the authorities that rebel. الطاغوت. They, are, they want to protect disbelievers. أَوْلِيَاءُهُمْ الطاغوت. Okay. So we have a wali and they have a wali. This much is clear? Now look. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ مَوْلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا That is because Allah is the mawla of those who believed. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentioned, we have a wali and they have a wali. So in Surah Muhammad, I'm expecting, we have a mawla and they have a mawla. But Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْكَافِرِينَ لَا مَوْلَى لَهُمْ As for disbelievers, they have no mawla whatsoever. They have no mawla at all. What does that mean? Allah, Allah is teaching us people that rebel, the authorities that rebel, the leaders of Quraysh, Fir'aun, and all those kinds of people, they can be wali. They can be wali for disbelievers. They, they can be protective of them. But at the end of the day, they can't be protecting them. There's no one actually protecting the enemies of Allah. 
وَنَّ الْكَافِرِينَ لَا مَوْلَى لَهُمْ This surah is about Badr. In Uhud, when Muslims suffered greatly, Abu Sufyan, who was not yet Muslim, he actually first made a praise of Hubal. Hubal was the false god they worshipped. Ala Hubal! May Hubal be exalted, raised, and the Muslims were to respond as they were climbing up the mountain and losing. The Prophet turns back and says, Allahu Akbar, in response. Allah is greater, meaning greater than Hubal. Then he said, Lana Uzza, wala Uzza lakum. We have Uzza. Uzza, by the way, the feminine form of Aaz. Aaz is like, you know, Akbar, Afdal, Ahsan, Aaz. And what's the feminine of Akbar? Kubra. What's the feminine of Ahsan? Husna. What's the feminine of Aaz? Uzza. It's like that. So Uzza, the feminine god of ultimate authority. Uzza, we have Uzza, you have no Uzza for yourselves. Allah's Messenger وسلم, told the Muslims to respond, Allahu mawla, Mawlana, wala Mawla lakum. Allah is our Mawla, you have no Mawla whatsoever. He didn't even say, Lana Allah, wala Allah lakum. No, no, no. Allahu Mawlana, wala Mawla lakum. Afsah bi kathir. It's so much more eloquent what the Prophet responded with, sallallahu alayhi wa وَأَنَّ الْكَافِرِينَ لَا مَوْلَىٰ لَهُمْ And the disbelievers will have nobody protecting them whatsoever. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدْخِلُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ No doubt Allah is going to be the one that enters the believers, those who believed, and those who have acted righteously into gardens, jannatin. There are two kinds of Muslims. There's muhajirun and there are ansar, the migrants, and the ones who aided them. And both of them are in economic difficulty. One, because they've left all of their assets behind. Two, because they're already not a very wealthy community to begin with. And now they have to share everything down the middle with another immigrant population. What happens to an immigrant population that comes, let's just say they migrated out of asylum, hundreds of them, thousands of them to a city. How, is the city treat, how does the city treat them? Where does it put them? It puts them in ghettos. It puts them in ghettos. And then people start, politicians or the wealthy start talking about how our neighborhood's getting messed up because of these people. Why do we have these foreigners around? They're taking away our jobs. They're eating our butter and bread. We, have, we barely have enough to feed ourselves with. You see? So this is actually something we're going to learn about a little bit later. But I'm letting you know, economic situation got tough. And then on top of that mentality that these foreigners are coming and polluting our city, the Prophet ﷺ successfully within those first six months created that brotherhood in which they would share bread, they would break bread together, they would live together. You know, they would sacrifice their, their, their businesses for the muhajirun. So they helped one another. Now, overall though, they're both suffering economically. They're both not doing that well. I mean, the fact that you're going into a, an, an army adventure with eight swords and, you know, less than ten horses is pretty telling how bad the situation is, okay? So what does Allah offer these people? Look, you've lost a lot, I know. But where I will take you, oh, you're going to be rich. You're going to be going into gardens. At the bottom of each of those gardens, there's going to be rivers flowing. So gardens are going to be on top of hills. And you look down the hill, and there's a river flowing. You ever been to a place like that? Where there's a mountain, there's a garden, it's beautifully laid out, and there's a beautiful river flowing under. Or there's a waterfall coming out from there. You know? Vacation spots on the planet. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا and those who disbelieve, يَتَمَتَّعُونَ They are enjoying themselves a lot right now. They're having a good old time right now. وَيَأْكُلُونَ And they're eating كَمَا تَأْكُلُ الْأَنْعَامِ Just like cattle eats. Just like cattle eats. How does cattle eat? <laughs> cattle just chews and chews and chews and chews. And it's got no manners whatsoever. It eats off the ground. It eats, eats whatever it can. تأكل الأنعام Allah compares the kuffar to cattle when they eat. I mean, these people eat like animals. They have no reservations in what they can eat. They just eat whatever. And that they are going to live a hedonistic lifestyle. They're going to live a lifestyle where they're just like animals. Animals have an urge. They go, a bird flies after the female bird. A monkey runs after the female monkey. That's what they do. Just like animals. They're hungry, they eat whatever, no restrictions on them. And let them have this animal life, because the most, meaning their greatest pleasure will be to live like animals. But you, you will have gardens, you will have rivers, you'll have something way better. So you'll have sophisticated rewards. And fire is their final place, and the place they will remain for a very long time, where they won't be able to get out. 
And how many towns have there been way before them? That have been way more intense in power than your town. Your town that expelled you. They dare expel you. This ayah offers the rationale for the Muslims going to war. Yes, the Quraysh are coming after us, but we have a reason to go. The ones who kicked you out. Ahlaknahum, those nations before we destroyed them. Fala nasira lahum. So forget la maula lahum. On top of that, there's also fala nasira lahum. They didn't have any aid or they have no aid whatsoever, no helper whatsoever for themselves. There's not, they're not even going to find backup. Afaman kana ala bayinatim min rabbihi. As for the one who is committed to clear proof that comes from his master, kaman zuyina lahu su'u amalihi. Can he ever be compared to someone? Who, for whom his most evil deeds have been beautified. What does this mean? He's actually doing evil deeds. The Quraysh in their mind, in their spin, in their rhetoric, they present to the people of Mecca that this man is a threat to our civilization. He's going to destroy our righteous religion. He's going to corrupt your family. We're trying to protect Mecca by killing Muhammad. We're, trying to pro- we're looking out for you. And this idea that they're loving their nation by hating Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Muslims is beautified in their heads. So Allah says, on the one hand, there's someone who's clear about what good is, and the other is delusional about what good is. They've got this delusional understanding of what good is. What tabaru ahwaahum, and on top of that, all they follow is their empty whims. It's not really based on any kind of proof. On the one hand, there's bayina, and on the other hand, there's ahwa, just empty whims that lead them to hate the Muslims. Mathalul Jannah, the example of Jannah, the comparison of Jannah. Some idea, look Muslims, I'm telling you about Jannah, Allah says, but I want to give you just a little bit of taste. Just a little. Allati wa'id al muttaqun, the one that has been promised to people that protect themselves. Fiha anharun, it's got a lot of rivers. Min ma in ghayri asin, that are made up of water that doesn't go bad. Ghayr mutaghayir yani, wa ghayr mumtin, it doesn't go bad, it doesn't go stale. وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ لَبَنٍ And rivers of milk. Now, you know, Fusayna's dua at graduation comes to mind. أَنْهَارٌ مِنْ One of my students made dua in Arabic for me at the graduation ceremony. That may Allah give me rivers of chocolate milk in Jannah. Because I'm obsessed with chocolate milk. But hey, I mean, Allah did say milk. So what's, the, what's so bad about adding a flavor? So, أَنْهَارٌ مِنْ لَبَنٍ Rivers of milk. لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ طَعْمُهُ What happens to milk when you leave it out? In Texas especially, you leave it in the trunk, it becomes yogurt. And not the kind you can eat either. Right? So, لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ طَعْمُهُ Its taste will not change. It won't go bad. You know, sometimes you take the, even in the fridge, you take out the milk and you go, Oh! إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ And then you just mess with your sister, say, hey, smell this. Smell this. It's really good. مِنْ لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ طَعْمُهُ وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ خَمْرٍ And rivers made of wine لَذَّةٍ Of wonderful taste You know wine is supposed to be sour, I hear? It's supposed to be like a... It's an acquired taste, they say Like it tastes disgusting until you become an addict and you get used to it <laughs> Allah says, no Wine then is going to be of taste itself لَذَّة Not لَذِيذَة خَمْر is one of the feminine words in Arabic And you're expecting here خَمْرٍ لَذِيذَةٍ but actually Allah says khamrin laddatan. You know what that means? It's like you've never experienced taste until you've had it. It's going to be taste itself. You know, laddatan lishalibin for those people that are going to be drinking it. Wa anharum min asalin and rivers of honey, musaffan that has been purified. There's not even a single blemish in there. Pure, clear honey, crystal clear honey. Wa lahum fiha min kulli thamarat and they will have in it all kinds of fruits. Wa maghfiratun min rabbihim. And forgiveness from their master. Now you think, who needs this stuff? Why do I need rivers of honey and you know, milk and wine? And... You, you're just not rich enough. That's why you're thinking like that. You know the very, very wealthy in the world? You know what to do with food? When, in their elite parties? They, they have TV shows about this now. So we have some, some glimpse into the lives of the rich and you know, obnoxious. What do they do? They have fountains of drinks that you can just get out of. They have waterfalls of drinks you can just drink out of. Anhar, literally anhar of drinks. 
for the very wealthy in this world that are the closest you will get in this world to Jannah. You'll find the very things Allah describes in Jannah. Why though? They didn't read the Quran and come up with that. Because Allah imprinted in our psyche something about Jannah. Something about Jannah is in our head. We, Allah describes gardens. We love gardens. Cities that are green are just naturally more beautiful cities. They attract more tourists. People want to go there and take pictures. People, especially as people get older, you know what they like doing? Gardening. It's kind of ironic, right? That naturally, human beings, as they approach death, want to be in a garden. Isn't that crazy? Allah is offering us a garden. And then people, when they really want to relax, when they want to be calm and there's no worries, they want to go to a beach. They want to go to a river. They want to see water and the sun sparkling on the water. Jannatin tajri min tahtihal anhar. You know? People want to live longer, they want to eat healthy food. And what's the number one list item on the list? Fruits. Fruits and vegetables. Fruits. Longevity, life, you know, nature. And, and what's the most expensive thing nowadays? Organic fruit. Organic vegetables. Organic milk. As though there's such a thing as inorganic, but we've done that, right? That's, it's like, we've gone out of our way to make it organic. No, it was originally organic, dude. You put the chemicals in there. Now I have to buy organic eggs. <laughs> As opposed to buying bionic eggs, you know. <laughs> They'll have all kinds of fruits in it. This is all human nature. It's all already there. This is not primitive, or oh, these people were living in a desert, that's why Allah offered them all this stuff. This is programmed into our minds. Allahu A'lam, we'll find this out on Judgment Day. But I do know that we, you know, we are children of Adam alayhi salam. And Adam alayhi has a direct taste of Jannah. He's got a ladha of Jannah because he was there. He knows what we're missing. And I don't know, something of that's been passed down. Generation after generation, to all of humanity. Everything Allah describes, we like. Down to the smallest details, mind you. I've talked about this before. Cups. Put upside down. Most expensive restaurants, catering halls, weddings. What do you find? Glasses upside down. The most elite kinds of party settings, you'll have people, young men, waiters, running around. And even the women are dressed like men. Did you notice that? They're dressed in those tuxedo things. <laughs> Allah talks about young men running around serving food. Trays coming, people coming and filling the drink for you. Fountains of drinks. And harum min asal in musaffa. Wa maghfiratun min rabbihim. And unto, of course, what already came is forgiveness from their master. Kaman huwa khalidun fin nar. Can he ever be compared to the guy that's going to be there in the fire forever and ever? Wa suqu maman hamima. And they're going to be given to drink water that is hamim. Baligan al ghaya fil harara. It reaches the highest extent it can reach in heat. Hamiman, boiling, scorching water. amaahum. Then it cuts, it tears open their veins. You know when you pour acid on like tissue, it rips it open, tears it open. Allah describes that happening when these people drink. This water is so hard, it rips open their veins. amaahum. You know if you drink coffee too hot or something and you feel it, it still hasn't ripped your veins, you just felt it. Imagine it just tears you up inside. That's what's being described for these people. So on the one hand, there was this wonderful drink. Multiple flavors available. And on the other hand, these people are being tortured internally because of drink. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَسْتَمِعُ إِلَيْكَ Now the surah takes a turn. Among these people, there's a, there's a category, a class of person that listens to you very carefully. This guy sits there. This hypocrite comes to the company of the Prophet ﷺ, and this phenomenon will exist to this day. They'll come and listen. Fully attentively. Until they leave your company. They were right. Min indik yani kanu qaribina jiddan. Min indik. You know? Inda dhil arshi makin. Hinama yasif subhanahu wa ta'ala qurba jibril alayhi salam lahu. Inda dhil arsh. Hatta idha kharaju min indik. When Allah describes the, the closeness. Of Jibreel he says, عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ He's right there. And now, خَرَجُوا مِنْ عِنْدِكَ 
When the Prophet described that the uh, when the Allah described that the Sahaba are very close to the Prophet and they might leave that closeness, لن فضو من حولك, you know, and من عندك also we find من عندهم, the the ones who are the, the ones that are with him من عنده, they're right there. So he's close. Now the people who are sitting close, imagine back in the day, there's no microphone system, right? So there's a bunch of people sitting in a room, the Prophet is talking, there's a person close, there's a person far. Who can hear him better? person that's sitting close. Obviously he can hear him better. And this guy's close. Then they, when, they, when they leave, when the Prophet is left, then they find the people of knowledge, those who are known among the Sahaba as the knowledgeable, and they go to them and say, What was he talking about? What was he talking about? Did they really hear, did they hear what he was talking about? Sure. But they're like, did he really say that? Mada qala anifa? What did he say just now? Anifa yani al an. Just now. What was that he said? Are you for real? He said we're going to war. Are you kidding me? No, no, no. I, I think I heard wrong. Could you tell me what he just said? And they're doing that because they're looking for someone to validate their concern. Like when you go to somebody and say, can you believe what he just said? And the guy that you talk to says. Yeah, I know. That was crazy, right? So you got validated. So they're looking for somebody else to jump on the bandwagon with them. And they don't want to say that I don't agree with what he said. So the smart way they put it is, What did he just say? What did he just... I can't... I don't think I heard it correctly. Because if I heard it correctly, that, you know... That's a big problem. Those are the kinds of people that Allah has placed a seal on their hearts. By the way, if they were sitting right by the Prophet ﷺ and they didn't understand what he said, what could they have done? Ask him. They waited until they left. They don't want to deal with the Prophet. They just want to make trouble. In نَقُولْ فِي الْعَرَبِيَ لِكُلِّ خِطَابٍ جَوَابٍ Every speech has a critical response. And you can criticize the speaker, fine, but to criticize him behind his back. Man up and talk to him yourself. But he just wants to create more dissent in the group. This is what we learned in Surah At-Tawbah. وَلَا أَوْضَعُوا خِلَالَكُمْ يَبْغُونَكُمُ الْفِتْنَةِ They run their horses up to the front of the caravan and say, Hey guys, you really want to go here? Because I know we're going to get killed by the Romans. Then they run their horses back and say, Hey guys, those guys up there, they're really scared. Because they were telling me they wanna get, they're going to get killed. What do you guys think? they go create problem for the entire caravan. This is what they're doing, creating dissent among the Muslims. And this is at the time of war. Notice, they're already out of Medina. They're already heading to battle. Now this surah comes down. This is not the time to be unsure about what's going on. This is the, at this point, for a soldier to be unsure is death. You can't be unsure when you're about to head into battle. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ طَبَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَاتَّبَعُوا أَهْوَاءَهُمْ Those are the people that Allah has placed a seal, a lock upon their hearts and they have followed their empty, pathetic desires. This description, they've desi- they followed their desires. Who was this description given to before? Disbelievers, wasn't it? وَاتَّبَعُوا you know, اتبعوا الباطل, اتبعوا أهواءهم. Now this description is being given to the hypocrites. And this is no accident. It's the same surah. It's like Allah is saying, you've got an enemy there on the other side of the battlefield, and you've got an enemy on this side too. And they're the same as far as I'm concerned. That's why later on in Quran, Ya ayyuhan nabi, jahid al-kuffara wal munafiqina waqlud alayhim. Fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites. We put them together. You know. وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْا And those who've committed themselves to guidance, who don't take into this propaganda, who don't listen and don't get taken in, and don't even pay attention to these guys, زَادَهُمْ هُدًا Allah will increase them even more in terms of guidance. وَآتَهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ And He will give them their taqwa. Meaning the taqwa was already there. In, in this surah, we're going to see a tafsir of a very powerful thing Allah mentions elsewhere in the Qur'an. In Makkah Qur'an, Allah says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah says Allah inspired the human being you know in Japanese philosophy they talk about the yin and the yang, right? There's a, there's a potential goodness in us. And there's also a potential evil in us. We have both. We have both inside of us. Allah empowered us with both. Now, Allah says that potential taqwa they already had, Allah granted it to them, He activated it. It was like it was always there, but Allah pressed the on button on their taqwa. Just because they didn't listen to the propaganda. But what the other side is going to be, we'll see that also. فَهَلْ يَنظُرُونَ إِلَّا سَاعَةً 
Are these people waiting around? Would they like to procrastinate until the hour itself arrives? That it will come and attack them all out of nowhere? Then they should realize that its great signs have already come. The signs of the hour have already... Are you waiting for the Day of Judgment to come? Because one of the greatest signs of the Day of Judgment, the Prophet himself has already come. فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاتُهَا يَعْنِ عَلَامَاتُهَا أَمَارَاتُهَا It's indications. فَأَنَّ لَهُمْ إِذَا جَاءَتْهُمْ ذِكْرَاهُمْ Then how are they going to benefit when the final reminder comes to them? If this Qur'an is not benefiting them, and if the greatest sign of the Day of Judgment is not benefiting them, how, what good is their remembrance on the Day of Judgment then? What's the point of it then? فَعْلَمْ Then you had better know. You had better know to refresh your faith altogether. Annahu la ilaha illallah. That he, that in fact the truth is, no one is to be worshipped or obeyed except Allah. Know it all over again. It's as though through the Prophet, the hypocrites are being told that you need to take your shahada again, guys. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ And ask forgiveness for your sin. وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ And for the believers, ask for their forgiveness and ask for the forgiveness of believing men and believing women. This is the power of the Qur'an. In battle, do you usually talk about women? Do you usually bring up women in battle? No. And even in classical times, of course, nowadays you have G.I. Jane, but back in the day, that's not a phenomenon. Women did not engage in battle. But Allah Azza wa Jal makes it a point in this surah and in the next surah, which is about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and there were virtually no women there, except the Prophet's wife, to make sure he mentions the believing women, because he is telling the Muslim Ummah a very important lesson. He is telling the Muslim Ummah that when you go into battle, your wives are in the battle too, your mothers are in the battle too. It is a battle for them to let you go into the battlefield. It's not easy. There's a, there, they have to battle their hearts. They have to, you're suffering physical torture, they're suffering psychological torture. You're both in it. It's a very powerful thing that in the surahs of battle, Allah didn't just say al-mu'mineen. Actually in Arabic, al-mu'mineen includes men and women. But He highlighted the women. He highlighted, because they're suffering too. How many sons letting their, how many mothers letting their sons go? You know? How many, how many you know, daughters letting their fathers go? How many wives letting their husbands go? How many brothers, sisters letting their brothers go? They're letting go of their men. And these are, these are the people that provided, they were their, their awliya, they were their protection. They were the heads of the household, they depended on them. They're, you know, you know, much less now, but women are so dependent in Medina on the heads of the household. And they let them go for the sake of Allah. So if the, if the believers, if the sahaba think they're out in the open in the battlefield, exposed to danger, that's just as exposed as the women in Medina feel. They're also, in, they're also in difficulty, like they've never been before. Now, the thing here that I want to talk to you guys about, I don't know if there's battery life left. There is. You guys, you okay? You'll survive or no? Tariq? Yeah. You'll survive? Okay. Okay, if you'll survive, we've got to talk about this now. And finish the ayah, inshallah. Can you, Allah says to the Prophet, you ask forgiveness for your sin. Allah tells the Prophet, you ask forgiveness for your sin. I already talked about how the Prophet's sin is not to be compared with our sins. Hasanatul abrar sayyatul muqarrabin. The good deeds of the righteous are actually like the bad deeds of the really close to Allah. Our good deeds, if we are righteous, are like the worst days of the, real, the ones that are really close to Allah. And when Allah talks about the Prophet's dhamb, you will notice in the Qur'an, whenever Allah talks about the Prophet's them, it's always in the context of battle or strategy, military strategy. It teaches us something very peculiar. The Prophet ﷺ is the most intelligent man that ever lived on the face of this earth. And yes, Allah gave him the most powerful revelation ever, Qur'an. But that doesn't mean that every decision the Prophet made ﷺ came only from the Qur'an. Allah chose him for a reason. That even when revelation doesn't come, he exercises his incredible intellect, his 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 own you know prerogative initiative, which is part of the sunnah too. Allah doesn't just say you are awesome because I may, I put that in you. Allah says you are awesome because of your own character too. In nakala ala khulukin azim, you are committed to a great character yourself. You yourself are awesome. You see, Muslims have to understand that. The Prophet ﷺ delivered, it brings two greatnesses. 
One greatness is from Allah, the revelation. The other greatness is his own personality. Before revelation. His own self. His own self is part of what we believe in. Part of the greatness we admire. And we don't deny it. And in this surah, how was his own personality outside of the fact that he's a messenger highlighted? By not even seeing Rasul next to his name. Allah highlighted that aspect of his personality. You understand what I'm saying? Now, sometimes Allah purposely would not reveal to the Prophet wasallam what he wants him to do. Allah could, and he did so many times. But sometimes Allah purposely did not reveal to him what he should do. And he let the Prophet ﷺ exercise his own best judgment. And as, a, as the most intelligent human being, and the most wise human being on the face of this planet, we have to believe, absolutely have to believe, that whatever decision the Prophet made on his own, وسلم, is the best possible decision humanly possible. At the level of a human being, nobody could have made a better decision. So my conviction is, and the conviction I'm trying to share with you is, when the Prophet said, let's take, وسلم, when he said, let's take Abu Bakr's option, let's not take the Umar option, then at the level of a human being, you could not possibly have made a better decision. The only one that has the authority to say there is a better decision possible cannot be a human being, it has to be Allah. And the only one that sends the correction and says, no, you shouldn't have let them go, the only one that can be that is Allah. If you understand that, then you understand the word them. Them comes from the word thanab. Thanab means the tail of an animal. And them is used for sins or deeds that aren't evil in and of themselves, but their consequences are bad. I'll say that again. If the deed is evil in and of itself, Lying, cheating, stealing, robbing, murder, that's a sayyi'ah. That's an evil and ugly thing in and of itself. A dhamb is not a sayyi'ah. A dhamb is something that may be good, may be bad, but definitely its results are undesirable. Just like a tail is not necessarily a bad thing, but what comes out of it is pretty bad. That's the logic. You understand? Now, the Prophet ﷺ does takes a decision. He makes the decision, we should set the prisoners free. Who's the only one who could have known the results of this decision will not be desirable? Allah. That's why it's a thumb. That's why it's a thumb. Thumb, another implication of thumb is that which is embarrassing. Because the tail is the embarrassment. Tail is the, actually there's poetry like that. The nose is considered the point of pride, pride in Arabic poetry. And the tail is considered the point of Embarrassment. So there was a tribe that called themselves Anfunnaqa. Anfunnaqa, the nose of the camel. So because that's the point of pride and it's a high animal, so we have a lot of pride. And the poet that used to diss them used to call them Dhanabunnaqa. So he used to call them the tail of the camel. Because <laughs> that's a good diss. Now, what am I trying to tell you? The Prophet, ﷺ, even though he's done nothing wrong, even though he's made the best possible human decision, and he hasn't violated any revelation at all, is still embarrassed. He's still embarrassed before Allah. Because he expects so much more from himself. And so Allah says, you should make istighfar for your dhamb. And by the way, this ayah came before or after? Before the, before the fact. Whatever dhamb you think you have, whatever thing you're embarrassed about, that you didn't think you did so well, just keep, make, make istighfar for it. And what's amazing is, by the way, dhamb is always singular for the Prophet. Allah never says, فَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِي ذُنُوبِكْ Like Allah is saying, there's one thing you're embarrassed about, or something that sticks out, just okay, make istighfar for that. And you know what's even more beautiful? Even more beautiful. This word dhamb will come in the next surah. لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكْ وَمَا تَأَخَّرْ so Allah may forgive whatever thumb you may have done, Prophet. Whatever thumb may have happened from you. But you know, in the same exact passage, what does Allah say? When He talks about believers, عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ <laughs> So He can forgive their actual sins. <laughs> he compares thumb of the Prophet to the sayyat of the mu'mineen. SubhanAllah. So, you know, when we read these ayat in translation, there's a problem. So Allah may forgive your sins, and people start thinking, what sins? 
And then some, some ulama, unfortunately, in our past, even wrote, oh, the Prophet made minor sins. Ma'adullah. We don't accept that. Our, our scholars, our tradition is not one way. It's, people said a lot of stuff in our tradition. Some of it acceptable, some of it not. Like we talked about in the story of Dawud alayhi salam, right? So the things you can accept when you read them, and even if you don't accept them, we make dua for those scholars, but we don't take what they said. Or at least I can't, in good conscience. But then alhamdulillah, we have scholars of great insight that offer these, like, these, this picture into, look at the surah, look at where it's coming, look at the context in which it's being mentioned. Put the picture together and you'll appreciate something about the Prophet ﷺ that you didn't. And the last comment about them now. So them, strategic error, which can only be called an error by the divine. As at the human level, it's not even an error. Another thing. When a general loses in a battle, are the soldiers at, are blamed or the general is blamed? Even though the soldiers messed up. He gave the right instructions, they didn't follow through or whatever. The one who will take responsibility for it all will be the general. If you're the store manager and your sales are, are, are less than what's expected, the CEO will come and ask the employees or the manager? He'll ask the manager. You have to seek forgiveness. If there's any shortcoming, then you have to seek forgiveness for yourself. Why? Because you're the believer of, and that's what Al Mu'minin Al Mu'minat is doing there. Ask forgiveness for the Mu'minin and the Mu'minat because you're in charge. I'll ask you first. And so seek forgiveness on their behalf too. Their, you should consider their mistake yours. You should own their mistakes because you're their leader. That's the, the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ. And through his leadership, we are learning what true leadership is. That when you and I as leaders make a, our, our employees, our volunteers, people who work under us, when they make a mistake, it's not their mistake, it's my mistake. I wasn't enough of a leader. Allah tells the, the man who never made a mistake in leadership, you, make, you take ownership of any mistakes your, your following makes. فَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِي ذَنْبِكْ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مُتَقَبَّلَكُمْ وَمَثْوَاكُمْ And Allah sees your coming forward, your, your place of change, where you've come from, and He knows where you're going to be staying. مَثْوَاكُمْ مَقَامُكُمْ حَيْثُ تَسْتَقِرُونَ Where you're going to be, where you're going to be staying. Allah sees, Allah knows the constantly changing situation that you people are going to go through. You're not going to be in one place. مُتَقَبَّلْ You're constantly going to be, you know, changing. And you're going to be meeting things. You're going to be meeting new challenges over and over and over again. And finally, you will be in one place in your matwa. And Allah knows that. So this dunya is called mutaqabbal. Uh, or mutaqallab, sorry, I keep mispronouncing it. Mutaqallab. And uh, Allah knows your matwa. Mutaqallab, once again, you keep changing. From taqallab. You know, يَوْمَ تَتَقَلَّبُ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارُ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارُ Hearts are going to be changing, turned over. So Allah knows when you head forward, when you head backwards, and how Allah will give you different kinds of instructions. So with that, inshallah ta'ala, we'll conclude our first dars on Surah Muhammad. Hopefully we can finish it in the next session and start even the longer surah, Surah Al-Fatih. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَإِذَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ مُحْكَمَةٌ ذُكِرَ فِيهَا الْقِتَالِ رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ نَظَرَ الْمَغْشِيِّ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ فَأَوْلَى لَهُمْ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم اما بعد انسى كان السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته we're on ayah number 20 of surah muhammad ويقول الذين امنوا لولا نزلت سوره the believers would say how come no surah has come down those who claim to believe said how come no surah has come down what this could mean الذين امنوا could be sarcasm it could be Allah saying, those who claim to have iman, how, are they, how come they're saying, how come a surah didn't come down? It could also be that believers heard so much trash talk from the munafiqoon. Look, the Prophet wants to go to battle on, on, all on his own. There's no ayah in the Qur'an that says we should go to battle. So how come there's no Qur'an coming? And even the believers started thinking, Ya Allah, if only you sent a surah, this would end the matter. It would close the deal. So they started thinking, how come no surah comes down? Even if it comes down little by little. Nuzilat. Instead of unzilat. Unzilat means the whole thing comes down. Nuzilat means little by little it comes down. Even if a little bit of a verdict comes down, it would end this problem. فَإِذَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ مُحْكَمَةٌ Then when a surah was completely sent down, that it fulfills the commandments and has, it's very muhkam, meaning firm, and its commandments 
رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضْ Then you're going to see those who have a disease in their hearts, يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ They'll just be staring at you. They're just, you know, when the surah starts getting revealed and he starts reciting it, they're like, oh God, we've been campaigning this whole time, he's making this up on his own, no surah even came down. Quran didn't say this, it's just the Prophet saying it, and now a surah came down, so there's just dead stare at the Prophet. نظر المغشي عليه من الموت The look that is enveloped in death. مغشي meaning the guy who's passing out because of death. You know, somebody's about to like, oh. That, that look of, oh my God, I'm dead. نظر المغشي عليه من الموت فأولى لهم أولى is a curse in Arabic. فأولى لهم, then they should be cursed. Then curse them. طاعتون Obedience is the only thing necessary. It's not even a sentence. Just obey. Obedience. Okay? وَقَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ And if you're going to say something, you better say something decent. وَقَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ Oh, messenger, we're going to go fight. Here's a strategic advantage I think we should take, it, you know, take into consideration. Maybe we should go into this position or that position. Now from when you speak, you speak in proper protocol. قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ فَإِذَا عَزَمَ الْأَمْرِ Then when the decision has already been affirmed, فَلَوْ صَدَقُوا اللَّهِ Then had they confirmed the truth in Allah And you know it's interesting we expected لَوْ صَدَقُوا الرَّسُولَ طَاعَةٌ بَقَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ فَإِذَا عَزَمَ الْأَمْرِ فَلَوْ صَدَقُوا الرَّسُولَ But it says وَلَوْ صَدَقُوا اللَّهَ Confirming the truth in the messenger is confirming the truth in Allah The messenger was the one who said let's go and fight But Allah says if they, if they were true to Allah by being true to the messenger لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ It would have been so much better for them فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ Then is it going to be the case? إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ This is a very heavy ayah. There's two interpretations of this ayah. Uh, uh, previously, I was when I first did a detailed dars on Surah Muhammad, I only got a little bit through it. I didn't get very far. Um, I took one interpretation, but I'm actually more convinced now of Shah Walila Dahlwi's interpretation of this ayah, rahimahullah. I'll share both with you. Uh, the one meaning is, فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ Then is it possible for all of you, إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ That if you were to turن away, turn your backs from the battlefield. أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ That you are going to cause corruption in the earth, meaning you will be held liable for the corruption that happens in the earth if you don't go into battle. The enemy of forces, they're out in full force. Shirk is being spread in society. It's like a cancer in Meccan society, in Arab society. You have to engage these people in battle and clean the house of Allah. And if you don't do so, then there's going to be corruption in the land. And تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ And you're going to end up cutting family relations. أَرْحَامَكُمْ Meaning the corruption will enter even into households. It's going to be even the closest relations. Relations of the womb will be cut if you don't engage in this battle. So one interpretation is, Allah is telling the Muslims that, that, are, that are about to go into Badr, if you don't go into Badr, there are some very heavy evil consequences in the entire region that are even going to affect families. أَرْحَامَكُمْ You'll end up cutting up family ties or family ties will be cut as a result of your behavior. But the other interpretation is very interesting. And that is because the word tawalla in Arabic means two things, two very different things. Tawalla means to turn away, tawalla also means to take control, to take command. Tawalla al-amr, fatawalla anta jami'a amrik, like ma hakka jilduka mithla dhifrik, ma hakka jildaka mithlu dhifrik, fatawalla anta jami'a amrik. Imam Shafi'i's poetry, I think I've mentioned it before. Nothing scratches your skin better than your own nail. That's the first line of his poetry. Ain't nothing that does good for a scratch than your own nail. Therefore, take matters, your own matters, into your own hand. Take care of your own business. Don't be dependent on other people. <laughs> so, that's the... And here, there he uses the word tawalla to take control of your own matters. Tawalla anta jami'a amrik. Now, Shawalila Dahlbi rahimahullah argues that this ayah means you Muslims right now are true believers, weak believers, even hypocrites are among you. And in this kind of state, if you take power, if you take control over the region, it's not good. Because Muslims have to be a purified, cleansed nation before they get into the position of power. And if you do get into a position of power while you haven't been cleansed as a people, while the ranks of hypocrites lie among you that are more power hungry than anybody else, then what will come of the land? Corruption in the name of religion. And the true religion at that, أن تفسدوا في الأرض, that you're going to be causing a lot of corruption in the land. And now this is kind of taking political control. But Allah is teaching us when political control control is in the hands of the corrupt, it trickles down and even starts affecting family life. It even starts affecting families being cut. وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ So this is actually one of the great ayat in the Qur'an. If you, if you look at this interpretation, 
that talks about, you know, how, how sociologists and, you know, modernists and people like that, they look at religion and say, well, I don't believe in organized religion because organized religion has caused corruption in society and it's been a means of oppression in, in world history. And they have a point. It is true. And it's so true that Allah even warned us about that. You, Muslims, if you're not cleansed as a people and you come to the reins of power, you will also be causing corruption in the land. And you will also be the reason that family relations are cut. Meaning the corruption enters into the depths in the inside private walls of the homes. arhamakum. It's a pretty powerful ayah. It's a pretty powerful uh, uh, statement from Allah Azza wa Jal. Why though? Why at this juncture? Because the Muslims are being told in between the lines, in the Labiba min al isharati yafham, aqalman ki li ishara kafi hai. Right? That's, you know, for the smart person, the indication is enough. For those of you who don't know Urdu and Arabic, I don't know what else I can use. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the point is, going into battle cleanses out. It, depict, it clearly illustrates who's a hypocrite and who's not. People aren't willing to lose their life over this thing if they're not convinced of it and convinced of the Jannah that Allah has promised with the rivers flowing and all of that. So the people that are going to say, no thanks, we're not interested. And they were hiding behind the cover that the Qur'an hasn't been revealed. Now that the Qur'an's been revealed too, he's looking like, oh my God, I'm so dead. That guy will not go into battle, which means its battle itself in Madani Qur'an is the cleansing process of the Muslim community. It's how the Muslims are filtered out from the hypocrites, which otherwise are inseparable. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهِ Those are the people that Allah cursed. Meaning those people that, the kinds of people that take reins of power, they get control over a land, and then they cause corruption. So now if you look at Muslims today, Today's Muslims. I argue, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the entire Muslim world. I haven't traveled to the Muslim world. I don't know its situation firsthand. Whatever we know is from news and that's bits and pieces. Okay? We don't have a mature understanding of what's happening in the Muslim world. Those people know, know better what's going on there. But let me tell you, at the very least, I can I tell you our masajid in America, a great many of them feel like a microcosm of corrupt Muslim governments. That's what they look like. People come into power, they don't want to let go of it, they don't want to listen to the people, they want to backstab one another, lawsuits, this and that, and the, oh my god, this is a masjid? Looks like parliament in Pakistan. You know, or somewhere, what happened here? When people get power and they cause corruption, this angers Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we can't even have peace, Harmony, justice, fairness, transparency at the level of an organization. An organization is a bunch, a handful of people. It's not thousands upon thousands of people. It's dozens of people at best that are in the organization. If we can't even have transparency and justice and fairness and accountability in, at this level, how can we ever talk about ruling the land with Islam and Khilafah? And, what are you talking about? We have the first premise with which Allah says, you can't have power yet, Muslims. Even the Sahaba are told, you can't have power yet, you're not clean enough yet. You're not ready. And if you take power prematurely, you'll cause corruption. You'll create more trouble. This is a very heavy ayah. It doesn't absolve from us the responsibility to establish Allah's deen on the earth, but it does instill in us the necessity of cleansing ourselves. We have to clean our, get our act together. You can't have those high-level conversations until the, the, the very foundational things aren't, aren't there yet. And then, we're, I'm talking about at the level of organization, even at the level of a household. How much, how much unfairness from the head of a household, he's not even the head of state, he's not the head of an organization, he's just the head of a household. How much unfairness towards the children, towards the wife, towards giving her her mahr, to, towards giving the daughters their fair share and in inheritance, all of that stuff. At the individual level, there's corruption. That's, that goes to organizational level and then at the institutional level. This is, this is the state of affairs. And what does Allah say about people like that? Allahumma la taj'alla minhum, ula'ika alladheena la'anahum Allah. Those are the people that Allah cursed. People who took the reins of power and then created corruption in the name of Islam. Who gets the bad name when Muslim nations are corrupt? Islam does. Who gets the bad name when Muslim organizations are corrupt? Islam does. Why wouldn't Allah curse them? The, the religion that came to remove evil from the world is now being accused of evil because its ambassadors are evil. Its ambassadors are doing wrong. 
فَأَصَنَّهُمْ Then he muted them. وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارَهُمْ he, Or he, he, he made them uh, uh, deaf. Sorry, he deafened them. وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارَهُمْ And he blinded their eyes. So corrupt Muslim leaders are no longer able to hear anything. They don't hear the cries of the people. They don't hear the pleas. They don't see the blood that they're shedding. They just shed it. Have you seen what's happening in the Arab world? That man can't see. These, these rulers, they can't see the blood they're shedding. It's like they're killing insects. It's nothing to them. No pleas, no recitation of Qur'an. These people are being hauled into prison. They're reciting ayat of Qur'an about how the angel will ask you what you did with us today. Allah will question you, interrogate you. These soldiers don't care anything. Because they've been, they've been muted. They've been deafened. Does, doesn't nothing goes through now. وَأَعْمَى أَبْصَارَهُمْ And so Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ Didn't they reflect deeply into the Qur'an? Didn't they look behind what the Qur'an is saying to them? Tadabbur comes from dubur. Dubur means the back. Tadabbur means when you hear something, you think about what's behind it. When you look at the ocean, you wonder what's at the depth of it. What kind of life is underneath? You don't just think of what's on the surface. When Allah says Allah says something, you think about what implications lie behind what Allah just said. What are the consequences of what Allah is saying? Don't they, reflection doesn't begin to cover the word. They, they, trans, they translate it, don't they ponder over the Qur'an? Don't they reflect on the Qur'an? But reflection is one dimension of it. They, don't they dive deep into the meanings of the Qur'an to figure out how it applies? The tadabbur literally as a verb, you know what it means? To look at someone, to check something out backwards and forwards. You know how somebody's trying to sell you something fake? Like somebody tries to sell you, you, you ever go to those phone stores and they have those like plastic iPhones or paper iPhones? It looks like a real phone though, but it's, it's fake. And you touch it and you go, oh, whoa, behind it, it's just paper. Right? The tadabbur is to check the back of it, to see what's going on, what's the reality of it. Didn't they observe the reality of the Qur'an? Didn't they make time for And that takes time, right? That takes time to study Qur'an, to reflect on it, to think about it deeply, to think about how does it apply to me. But then, you, they don't have time for that because their hearts are busy somewhere else. So Allah says, Am ala aqfaluha. Or is it the case that the hearts, some hearts, have their own locks placed on them? Before we, we saw, وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ Now we're seeing aqfaluha. The hearts have their own locks. These hearts that Allah gave us, they actually came with built-in locks that are open right now, but if you don't take advantage of the opening, then those locks will be activated. And the locks will get... There's not some outside lock that comes. It's already there. It's already... This is the fujuraha wa taqwaha. This is the fujur inside the human being is the lock that's already there. That's why the ilafa is so, so important. Aqfaluha. As opposed to am ala qulubin aqfalan or aqfalun. No, aqfaluha. Magaliquha yani, locks. So, and look at what this ayah does from another point of view. Reflection, pondering, thinking carefully is a brain exercise. It's an exercise of the mind. But what the lock is placed on is the heart. So Allah combined the intellectual. Who is going to exhaust their intellect studying this book, trying to figure out its meaning for their own benefit, if not a person whose heart is sold on this book? Otherwise, people will have a shallow view of this book. And immediately, the disease in their heart will say, this doesn't make any sense. That's un that seems unfair. How come the Qur'an says this? How come the Qur'an says that? That's because there's no tadabbur. And there's no tadabbur because the heart is not in it. There's no reflection because the heart's not into it. Subhanallah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَدُّوا عَلَىٰ أَدْبَارِهِمْ Those who turn back on their adbar. Adbar from dubur, which is also tadabbur, right? So it's wordplay. It's wordplay here. So Allah Azza wa says, those who turned on their backs, مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْهُدَىٰ Until a, even after guidance had been made abundantly clear to them, الشَّيْطَانُ سَوَّلَ لَهُمْ The fact of the matter is, that shaitan is the one that made convenience for them. تَسْوِيل to, For something to become easy for you to do. For something to be no big deal for you. So then their evil deeds and their lack of following the Prophet wasallam and their lack of seriousness about changing themselves and their faith, their lack of reflection and lack of relationship on the, about the, in regards to the Qur'an, Allah says, Shaitan is in fact the guy, his successful venture with you is for you to say, what's the big deal? Taswil is to convince you it's no big deal. Sawwala lahum. And then, wa amla lahum. Imla in Arabic, 
to fill you with long-term hopes. What do you want to do? Well, you know, first I want to buy a house, maybe start a business, do this, that, the other. I got these plans. I want to get married. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to go to school here. I want to graduate from there. Then I want to move to this city. I want to live in LA one day. I want to live in New York City. You know, people have aspirations and dreams. As Shaitan says, first, he made it easy <coughs> for you to disregard the Qur'an. Easy for you. It became no big deal for you. Because as the Qur'an has nothing for you. Once that happened, the aspirations Allah wants you to have, gardens with those rivers flowing, homes, company of the righteous, those aspirations are not being given to you now. And they're not being given to you on a regular basis. So what aspirations are you filled with? The one shaitan wants you to have. The only future he has for you is dunya. That's the only future he wants you to worry about. So he fills you with worldly long-term hopes. أَمْلَى لَهُمْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لِلَّذِينَ كَرِهُ مَا نَزَلَ اللَّهِ And that's because that group of hypocrites, those are the people that in fact said to those who already hate what Allah sent down, who hated what Allah sent down? The Quraysh hated what Allah sent down. The people of the book, elements of them hated what Allah sent down. So now the, the, the hypocrites, when they heard that we're going to war, sent an SOS message, a private message to Mecca saying, guys, I know you're coming out to battle with Medina. People of Medina have no beef with you. It's this Muslim thing. And even though I'm Muslim, I think that they're a little too extreme when it came to this war. So, we're ready to fight. If things don't work out, you just, I just want you to know we're on your side. So they actually, they're, they're backstabbing the, the Muslims and going and saying, and some things will listen to you, of course. سَنُطِيعُكُمْ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَمْرِ We'll follow you in some things. Yeah, sure. And some issues, of course, will follow you. You guys are the heads of Arabia. You're the Quraysh. Why wouldn't we follow you? So they went to the haters of Islam and presented kind of a negotiation. You see, in Baqarah we saw, قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ When their plot got exposed, the Muslims said, لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Why are you going, going making negotiations with Quraysh? And they said, no we're, just, no, we're just negotiating peace. What are you talking about? And now Allah says, this is the peace they were negotiating. سَنُطِيعُكُمْ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَمْرِ Wallahu ya'lamu israrahum and Allah knew Allah knows in fact the things they try really hard to keep secret see lam yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala wallahu ya'lamu sirrahum a sir secret israr something you try to keep secret some there's a secret but there's not necessarily an effort it's a secret but something you really try to protect is israr asarra to keep a secret so what they were been trying to hide, Allah already knows, and then He exposed in this ayah. فَكَيْفْ Then how are things going to look? إِذَا تَوَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ When the angels are taking them away, يَضْرِبُونَ وُجُوهَهُمْ وَأَدْبَارَهُمْ Beating their faces and their backs. The angel hits them in the face, they grab their face and tip over, and he hits them on the back so hard, he pulls, pulls, holds his back and gets up, and he hits them on the face again, and this constant motion of pain when the angels execute their beatings. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ اتَّبَعُوا مَا أَسْخَطَ اللَّهِ That's because they have followed what enraged Allah. They have, and these hypocrites have followed what enrages Allah. سَخْت سَخْت وَكَرِهُ رِضْوَانَهُ And they are disgusted at the idea of wanting to please Allah. Whenever the, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, spend for this army, for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you gardens in paradise, and Allah will please, be pleased with you. The hypocrite listens to the speech and goes, yeah, yeah, sure, Allah will be pleased with me. I'd rather just be pleased right now. I don't need to go out of my way to please Allah. I'm, I'm doing pretty good already, thanks. They hated to please Allah. They didn't like that. And now at the 28th ayah of the surah, Allah says He seized their deeds, multiplied whatever good they might have done. After all, these hypocrites have prayed in jama'ah behind the Prophet ﷺ as their imam. We go for multiple rewards of prayer to Masjid al-Nabawi, al-Masjid al-Haram. We go pray there because one prayer counts for thousands. These people prayed behind the Prophet ﷺ. And some of those prayers must have been good. Not all of them were corrupt. But Allah says, what, what good is that? What good is that? فَأَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُ You and I get the reward for listening to a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. We get reward for listening to the Qur'an when it's being recited. But can you imagine the reward of listening to the Qur'an and the Prophet's reciting it? Listening to a hadith and the Prophet is saying it ﷺ? None of those good deeds count for these people. None of that counted. And so these are very strong ayat about people who backstab Muslims. 
سَنُطِعُكُمْ فِي بَعْدِ الْأَمْرِ We'll follow you in some things. We're not with the Muslims. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمُ اتَّبَعُوا مَا أَسْخَطَ اللَّهِ وَكَرِيهُ رِضْوَانَهُ What I was saying to you is in the 28th ayah of this surah, we find the description that's very close to what Allah began this surah with, with the kuffar. فَأَحْبَطَ أَحْمَالَهُمْ Now he's describing this war for the munafiqun, like they're in the same boat. أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ Have the people who, who have a disease inside of their hearts, way inside their hearts, have they assumed and لَنْ يُخْرِجَ اللَّهُ أَدْغَانَهُمْ That Allah is not going to bring out their dhagn, multiple shades of dhagn, ضَاد, غَيْن, نُون, أَحْقَادَهُمُ الشَّدِيدَ Really intense uh, irritation, uh, grudge, dhagn is really grudge. Grudge that, you know, builds into hatred. They have a grudge against the Messenger wasallam. They have a grudge against his instructions. They have a grudge against the changes that are happening in Medina. They don't like the way things are going, but they keep it inside because if they show that, then they can't be Muslims anymore. And they need to stay Muslim because they want to stay relevant. Muslims are the rising power. So Allah says, do these people think that this disease they have in their heart is going to stay inside? That Allah won't bring out their grudges? And if, if we want, we would show you all of these people. We would show you exactly, like Allah, Allah says, if we wanted, we could expose to you exactly who the hypocrites are. And this teaches us that Allah did not tell the Messenger وسلم, all of the hypocrites. He did not tell him. Some of them he did, sometimes he revealed. Like in Tabuk, he revealed 10 people that tried to assassinate the Prophet وسلم, And they were masked up, they were covered up. In the middle of night, they came, they tried to kill the Prophet ﷺ. They were among the Muslims, but they were spies, they were hypocrites. And they didn't succeed, of course. But in Revelation, Allah revealed to him exactly who they were by their name. And he came and told Hudayfa, Hudayfa, come here. I gotta tell you. I've tell, I'm telling you these names, but you don't tell anybody else. Now everybody knew Hudayfa knows. Right? And then Umar goes to him and says, Hudayfa, so is this my name in there? Am I in there? No, your name's not in there. I can't tell you who they are, but I can, I'll tell you you're not in there, okay? That's Umar radiallahu anhu. But Allah says, وَلَوْ نَشَاءُوا لَأَرَيْنَاكَهُمْ We would have shown you who these people are. فَلَعَرَفْتَهُمْ بِسِيمَاهُمْ Then you would have absolutely recognized them by their foreheads. بِسِيمَاهُمْ As though Allah would have given them a marking on their forehead in the ghaib that the Prophet could see. <laughs> But you know, right now, you will absolutely be able to recognize them with lahnil qawl, the inflections in their speech, their speech pathology, you'll be able to break apart. You'll be able to tell how the uslubu kalamihim al multawi, their twisted words, their overly flowery, flowery speech. You listen to them carefully, you'll know exactly where they stand. You know, when you, when you listen to a shady car salesman, you can tell he's got a bad car he's trying to sell you. If you're sharp, oh, this is the most amazing thing since sliced bread. It's a 1975 Ford Taurus. Only 350,000 miles. You're lucky I'm giving this to you. You see right through that, like, okay, dude, thank you. Only 10,000. You can see right through it. The Prophet is told, you are a very good observer. You can tell the way people speak from the way that the inflections they take. Lahnul qawl. The way they raise and lower their voice, their body language. You can tell from all of that where they stand. There's no surprise that the Prophet ﷺ, Allah even describes in this ayah the Prophet's ability والسلام, of figuring people out when they open their mouth. And he's telling us through that, you don't just observe what people say, you also observe how they say it. You have to observe how people say things. Body language is important. Speech pathology is important. Breaking speech apart is important. Figuring it, dissecting is important. وَلَتَعْرِفَنَّهُمْ فِي لَحْنِ الْقَوْلِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ أَعْمَالَكُمْ And Allah in fact, He knows your deeds. Your speech is one thing, your, your actions are another. That's a hypocrite, right? So Allah says, you'll see their speech is very elaborate. And Allah knows where your actions stand. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ And we will absolutely test you thoroughly until we get to know who the actual strugglers are. You see, this was the point. The cleansing. حَتَّى نَعْلَمُ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ Until we get to know. Until we get to expose who the real strugglers, the real mujahideen are, minkum, wa among you, was sabirin, and those who persevered regardless, wa nablu wa akhbarakum, and we will test your events. We will test your news. We will get to see when the news comes out, how, how each one of you reacts. 
in the ladina kafaru wa saddu an sabilillah no doubt those who have disbelieved and have obstructed others from the path of Allah the surah began with these exact words in the ladina alladhina kafaru wa saddu an sabilillah there are two editions here the first edition is inna the second edition is wa shaqur rasula bin ba'di ma tabayyana lahum huda so the two editions one is absolutely Get it through your heads. Anybody who disbelieved and stopped people from the path of Allah and opposed the messenger. He didn't even say opposed Allah. He said opposed the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who's included now in this conversation? The munafiqoon are. مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْهُدَىٰ Even after the guidance has been made abundantly clear to them, لَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا They will not be able to harm Allah in any way, shape or form. وَسَيُحْبِطُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ And soon Allah will take a hold of all of their deeds and nullify them. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ This is wa'u bayaniya. All those of you who have iman, obey Allah. That is to say, obey the messenger. This is not and. This is not obey Allah and obey the messenger. This is obey Allah, i.e. obey the messenger. That means obey the messenger and don't cancel out all of your deeds. وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ These three surahs that we're about to study, Surah Muhammad, then Surah Al-Fatih, and Surah Al-Hujurat. These three surahs are the Qur'an's comprehensive course on what does it mean to respect Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If somebody wants to study what's our relationship with the Prophet, what does it mean to be loyal to him? What does it mean to show him respect? How important is it to obey him? These are the three surahs you study. It's a comprehensive course. It's the, it's the Muhammad section of the Qur'an. These three surahs. It's, it's, I mean, of course, the Prophet's mentioned elsewhere too, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but this is the most com- these are the most comprehensive cases. وَلَا تُبْطِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ And, do, and do, do not end up canceling out all of the good deeds that you've done. Muslims are being told, look, you were with him in Mecca. You migrated with him. You were among the Ansars. You, you, you've been, you're going to help in the battlefield. But you disobey this messenger once, deliberately, openly, Defiantly, and all of that good that you may have done is gone. Don't cancel out your your good deeds. In the Ladina Kafaru wa Saddu an Sabidilahi, Thumma Matu wa Hun Kufar, no doubt those who disbelieved and have stopped others and themselves from Allah's path. Then they died while they were in a state of disbelief and and rejection. Falan Yahfir Allah Hulahum. Then Allah will not be forgiving them. When Allah says Allah will not forgive somebody, this happens only a few times in the Quran. Do you know who ha- what it happens for? There's only two kinds of people. Allah says Allah will not forgive them. Allah says about the mushrikun, in Allah la yafiru an yushraka bihi. Allah will not forgive that shirk should be committed with him. Who were the people of shirk? The mushrikun of Arabia first of all, and then anybody else after that. What's the only other case? In al munafiqina fi dar kil asfari min al nahr. Sawaun alayhim astaghfarta lahum am lam tasaghfir lahum lan yaghfir Allah lahum. Well, it's the same for the hypocrites. Whether you ask Allah to forgive them, the Prophet is told. Whether you ask for their forgiveness or you don't ask, Allah won't forgive them. Two groups of people Allah says He won't forgive: people of shirk who die in shirk and people of hypocrisy. This ayah com- applies to both. Those who've disbelieved, they've stopped others and themselves from Allah's path. They might, they died in this way, in this disbelief. This disbelief could have been exposed, could have been hidden. The hidden form of it is nifaq. The exposed form of it is shirk and kufr. فَلَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ Then Allah will not be forgiving them. فَلَا تَهِنُوا Then don't become weak. Don't become soft. You know the Prophet warned, Ali wasalam, this ummah, one day it will come, they'll become weak. Why will, why will other nations eat away at you like wolves eat, at, eat off of its prey? What will that happen? عَلَيْكُمُ wahan. The same word was used. You will be suffering from wahan. فَلَا تَهِنُوا Don't be weakened. وَتَدْعُوا إِلَى السَّلْمِ And don't call to peace negotiations now. This is not the time. And don't call to surrender. Salam also means surrender. وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ And you are the supreme. Not even you will be. You are the supreme. وَاللَّهُ مَعَكُمْ And Allah, while Allah is with you. وَلَنْ يَتِرَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ And he will not take away يَنْقُصُكُمْ أُجُورَهَا You know, he'll not take away the, 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 the compensation of your deeds at all away from you. He will not shortchange you in any of the efforts you do. So at the end of this surah, as we're, as we're tying up this surah, the whole surah was dedicated to these people, their deeds are cancelled, their deeds are cancelled, their deeds are cancelled, their deeds are seized, their deeds are wasted. And now Allah says, you people, don't get weak. Stay on course. Allah will not take away even a little bit from your deeds. 
إِنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ Worldly life amounts to nothing more than play and entertainment. وَإِن تُؤْمِنُوا وَتَتَّقُوا But if you can firmly believe and truly protect yourselves from sin, يُؤْتِكُمْ أُجُورَكُمْ He will give you your compensations. وَلَا يَسْأَلْكُمْ أَمْوَالَكُمْ And when he gives you your compensation, this is جواب الشرط. If you, can, if you can believe, if you can have taqwa, then he will give you your compensations, and then he won't ask you for your monies. So some interpret this to mean, because it's jawab al-shart, Allah will not ask you for your monies in the akhirah. Right now he will. And if, if he was saying, if anybody translated this ayah, and he does not ask you for your monies, that is a grossly mistranslated attempt. It's really bad. If they say, and he does not ask you for your monies, does not is impossible here because that would be la yasalukum amwalakum. The ayah says la yasalkum, which makes it the response, to, it's the then portion of an if statement, it's jawab shart, which means it has to be translated hypothetically. And in that case, he won't ask you for your compensations. This is where Arabic grammar becomes so important. Because when you study vocabulary of the Qur'an, yas'al means to ask. But yas'alu and yas'al, what's the difference? The meaning is worlds apart. The world, world apart. And then and you can completely, like you're saying, oh, Allah does not ask you for your money. Well, of course He asks you for your money. Didn't He ask for infaq? Of course, we're, we're talking about battle. What's the most biggest part of any country's budget? The military. So if we're going into battle, isn't He going to ask for infaq? Absolutely He's going to ask. But he says, if, if you can maintain taqwa, if you can maintain iman and taqwa, and finally you will get your compensations, that will be the time you will no longer be asked anymore. Yes, la yas'alkum amwalukum. But right now, if he was to ask you, in, in yas'alkumuha, if he was to ask you right now, for yukhfikum, then it would be very hard for you. Yujhidkum bitalabi kullil mal. He would put really difficult, harsh burden on you by asking you for all of that wealth. Tabkhalu. And in that case, if he did ask right now, you'd be cheap. You wouldn't give. Not all of it. Wa yukhrij adghanakum. And your grudges would start coming out. What do you mean all my money? What do you mean my house? What do you mean all my savings? I can't give all of it. Your grudges would start coming out. The same adghan is mentioned again. Ha antum ha ulai tudauna li tunfiqu fi sabilillah. Here you people are. You are being invited to spend in Allah's path. Faminkum man yabkhal. And among them is some, one of some of you that adds, acts cheaply and miserly. Wa man yabkhal fa inna ma yabkhalu an nafsihi. Then whoever would be cheap and would be miserly, would be greedy, then he's only being cheap and miserly against his own self. Wallahu al ghani. And Allah is free of need. He's not asking you because He needs anything. antumul fuqara, And you're the ones that are bankrupt. Muslims understand when you spend to make Allah's deen dominant, when you spend to support the Messenger's mission وسلم, then the people asking you for those funds and that help and that support that are sincerely working for those kinds of causes. You know, when I look at, for example, efforts like, you know, why Islam? And the, the, the stuff they do. And, you know, efforts like, you know, uh, 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 youth groups, youth efforts, whatever organization they belong to, whether it's MINA or YM, I don't, MSA, it doesn't matter. When they're doing good stuff, we should support that stuff. And they ask, people ask on behalf. You know, I personally, I have my personal grudges against fundraising the way it's done nowadays. I have a whole session, I should have a fundraising dinner to talk about how bad fundraising dinners are. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I know we're desperate, we don't know any other way of doing things, and of course creativity is haram for Muslims, so, you know, we're not allowed to think outside of a very small box, you know, because, you know, religiously, the Kaaba is a cube, therefore we have to think in a box, yeah. But, the, the, the fact of the matter is, Allah is free of need, He doesn't need you to spend, you're the ones that are bankrupt, you're the ones building your assets in Jannah. You're the ones that are, you're bankrupt. And the real, the reality of our bankruptcy, part of it is true now. We're completely dependent on Allah. But the real, like when it's really going to hit us, that we are in fact bankrupt is when? When we stand up in front of Allah. Then our bankruptcy will become absolutely clear. Then we'll realize how bankrupt we really were. And the only people that are happy that day are the people who actually have some akhirah savings. They have an account that doesn't just work in dunya, they have an account that works in akhirah too. So Allah says, that's up to you. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْدْ Scary, scary, scary ayah. And if you people turn away, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ He will replace you little by little. 
Yubdil, immediately. Yastabdil, little by little, generation after generation. He will replace you with another, a nation other than you. Ghayrakum, ghayr from taghayr, different. They're not, they're not, they're not going to be like you. They don't, they don't have the color of, your, of skin that you have. They don't speak the language that you speak. Oh, you Arabs. Oh, you mushriku, oh, Muslims even. If you Muslims, you're the custodians of Islam, the people of the language of the Qur'an, if you turn away, Allah will replace you with a different ethnicity of people altogether. A different nation altogether. Yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. Not ummah. Ummah will not be replaced. Qawm is replaced. There's no new ummahs coming. This is the ummah now. This is the ummah of Islam. But the ummah will be replaced with another qawm. The Iranis are a qawm. The, the, the Indians are a qawm. The Europeans are a qawm. Allah says, you don't do your job, I'll replace you. And you know this came true in our history? And it's slowly coming true now. It's slowly coming true now. 1258. Baghdad was invaded. This was the last of the Abbasi Empire. And when, these, when the, the, um, they, they dragged these Tatars, when they dragged the final ruler of Abbasis, they dragged him in dead animal skin and beat him to death with, uh, with whips in public. They killed, they massacred scholars. They made piles of heads of Muslim scholars in Baghdad. And they sit on top of them and eat their food. That's what they would do. It was ridiculous how much blood was shed. We were completely wiped out as a nation. And then what happens? These Tatars, these Mongols that came, from their descendants you have the, Te the Temuris, the Safawis, the Seljuti, and finally the Uthmani, the Uthmani Khilafah that we talk about are descendants of these people. Literally in Tatawallaw, Yastabdil Qawman Ghayrakum, we will replace you with a nation altogether. They, 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 and Thumma La Yakunu Amthalakum, they won't be like you. They're not going to be the likes of you you'll be replaced entirely. You think you're special? This ummah is special, but no qawm inside it is. The only thing that makes you special is that you're a member of this ummah, not that you're a member of a qawm. The aqwam, the Pakistani, the Indian, the Bangladeshi, the Egyptian, the Syrian, the Jordanian, the Somali, the Sudani, these are all replaceable to Allah. The ummah of Islam will stay. This is a scary reality. And this is true, this universal principle that Allah has given to us here. In tatawallaw yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. If you turn away from the religion, look at the vast majority of the Muslim community living in the United States. You and I, even the people that come to Jumu'ah, do not represent the vast majority of Muslims living in the United States. And even amongst that do come to Jumu'ah, Jumu'ah is not indication of taqwa. Jumu'ah is indication that daddy used to bring you and you're coming because it's something in you says I should come. It does not mean you're earning a halal income. It does not mean you're praying five times a day. It does not mean anything. Because we see numbers, we get happy. The, the people you see at Eid, you get happy. The reality of the ummah today, the, the, the state of affairs, not of kuffar, of Muslims, is scary. It's horrifying. I tell you, we are in a, it's such a comfortable religious bubble. And I'm grateful that, you know, I like bubbles. I personally do. It's good to be in one sometimes. But sometimes you step out of that and you step into reality and you see what Muslims are really up to. You go to the, the hookah places that are open up late at night, filled with Muslims. You know? You look at the sororities that are being run by Muslims on college campuses. If that's, if that's not turning away, I don't know what is. What else? How much more can you turn away from the deen? What's left? What shred of Islam is left? يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ He will replace you with a nation other than yourselves. So you'll have people. And you know, I, I, used to, I used to remember this ayah when I used to live in Long Island, in Bayshore. And there was a brother, really good brother, mashallah, a Puerto Rican, Christian guy. He walked into the masjid one day, just took shahada. I heard the adhan on the mic, two blocks over he lived. Heard the adhan, something went inside me. I just wanted to know what this message is. Got a Spanish copy of the Qur'an, read through it, took shahada. Took shahada, starts reading the Qur'an, comes to, wala taqrabu zina. Don't go near zina. I go, by the way, that's halfway into the Qur'an. That's Surah Al-Isra he was reading. So he started the beginning, and in a week he's already at 17. How many of you read translation in a week of the Qur'an? This guy just became Muslim. Got ta wala taqrabu zina. He was a Puerto Rican guy, used to live with his girlfriend, had a kid with her too. So he read this ayah. I said, I had no idea that Islam doesn't allow this. He started sleeping in the backyard. Didn't even tell anybody. His wife, his, his girlfriend's like, what's the matter with you? Why are you sleeping outside? I can't talk to you about this right now. Just, you'll understand eventually. Sleeping in the backyard. He said, if I go inside, it's too tempting. You know? And then eventually, 
He says, you know, he comes to, actually he came to me. Four weeks after, brother, um, I have a problem. What's the problem? See, I, I had a relationship before Islam and, you know, this is a girl and she's Christian. Is it okay for me to marry her? I was like, yeah, bro. So I did a nikah at his front porch. His extended family came. They did a nikah in the front porch. A few brothers in the masjid went and we just did their nikah. Okay. And subhanAllah. And I look at people like that and I say, man, you people turn away from deen. Allah, Allah, one by one by one, he'll start replacing you with people that will value this deen for what it is. They'll appreciate it for what it is. They won't take it for granted. They won't take it as something annoying that my parents passed down to me. Oh, they have value for it, man. It's, it's, it's at a different level. There won't be anything like you. They hear the ayat of Qur'an, even in translation. I know, I know African-American communities have gone to. They're just reciting, they're reading the English translation. And they're crying their heart out. They're just crying their heart out. They're so moved by, and I'm like, English? Yep, that's enough. That's how, how, how inclined their hearts are to the word of Allah. And we're being replaced. Literally, aqwam are being replaced. In Then they will be nothing like yourselves. May Allah Azza wa Jal not make us of those that get replaced. And make us of those that do change themselves. And never become of those who turn back from Allah's deen. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.